environmentalism as a philosophy, as a ism, uh, is born uh, in the modern world. As a moral philosophy and also as a social movement, environmentalism is only conceivable in the modern world. This book is a history of ideas. It's a profile of 10 remarkable individuals who wrote an insight and uh, about the challenges that humanity faces and India in particular faces. You have to look at, I mean, look at the ravaging of the Himalaya now. Hmm. Under a government which professes to be a Hindu government. Pani ki apni spriti hoti hai. Aap use apni jagah se hatayenge, wo lot aayega. It's interesting. Just as, uh, you know, uh, the Gandhian environmentalists of the 70s and the 80s did not know about Kumarapa at all and barely knew about Miravel, the saffron environmentalists today don't know about Kya Muchi. Welcome to yet another episode of Samvad. Last month, we discussed a literary memoir in one of our episodes. That book was about the relationship between a historian and his editor over four decades. The memoir was intensely personal, deeply intimate, and it went on to reveal the obsessions as well as, well as idiosyncrasies of both the historian and the editor. This week, we are back with yet another book of the historian, the new book, which explains, which confirms the remarkable range of his scholarship. This book is on environment, is speaking with nature, the origins of Indian environmentalism, and the author is Ram Chandra Goha. Thank you so much, Ram, for here, Thank for you, being sir. here. Now, the discourse on environment and environmentalism gained strength around the uh, 1970s. Chipko movement you have and you also have uh, Indra Gandhi introducing certain acts, Project yes, Tiger. Yes, yes. Then she brings in uh, 48, uh, Article 48A, Directive Principle, yes. which makes it a duty of the state to right. uh, protect and yeah. safeguard the, uh, the environment. Your book takes us several decades before yeah, yeah. and tells us about the stories of the pioneers or yeah. the ancestors of Indian yeah. environmentalism. Yes. How did the idea emerge in you? So the idea emerged uh, in me completely by chance and accident. And that often happens with a historian where uh, accidental discovery in a library or an archive sets you onto a new path. So of course I was interested in the subject of environmentalism as a philosophy, as uh, something that guided social action, social movements. And I had written my PhD on Chipko and its context. And uh, after I finished my PhD, I was briefly teaching in America uh, as a kind of young scholar, young lecturer. And I, in an American, great American library, I came across the works of two people, the sociologist Zara Kamal Mukherjee, and uh, whom I'd vaguely heard of because my PhD was in sociology, and a man called J.C. Kumarapa, whom I knew nothing about. And I found that both were writing in the 20s and the 30s. Mukherjee was a sociologist. Kumarapa had trained in economics and finance and then joined Gandhiji. He was part of Gandhiji's inner circle, very close to Gandhi. And he was a professor of economics in the Gujarat. He was a Christian, he was a Christian originally. He was a Christian. He was, in fact, one of Gandhi's closest Christian followers. He was also president at that time, professor of economics at uh, the Gujarat Vidya Peet. And uh, I found that their writings in different ways uncannily echoed and anticipated the debates of the 1870s and 80s that I was reading, listening to and sometimes writing about, about the clash between the profit motive of, uh, you know, industry and the subsistence needs of the villagers, uh, the ecological context of agriculture, which means there's a cultivated field where you grow some crops, but it's, it's surrounded by water, pasture, forest, which made that cultivation possible and which are never really taken into account in planning agricultural policy. Uh, Mukherjee also, uh, you know, I come from a family of scientists and Mukherjee was actually a social scientist and here he was talking about to understand the environmental predicament, you have to have a philosophical and you could even say uh, methodological union between the natural science and the social sciences because you can't break up Human beings are part of nature. They are also separate from nature. So I was reading the, these writings in the 20s and 30s and I said, there's an interesting prehistory of Chipko, you know, uh, unacknowledged, unknown. But here are people who are writing when India is in first entering the age of industrialization. The first big factories are coming. The cities are growing. You know, 
uh, the destruction of the environment, uh, forests in the countryside is proceeding apace. And they are seeing the consequences. Uh, and not just the consequences from the point of view of natural beauty, the jungle katiya, but what it does to soil erosion, to floods, to the needs of the tribals li living nearby. Uh, so I, I said, and then I looked more, and then I found some other such pioneers. Uh, so there was Mukherjee, there was Kumarapa, there was Varia Elvin on whom I already had an interest and I saw he wrote about the tribal connection with the forest. And then again I discovered a, uh, in the library a well-known Scottish town planner called Patrick Geddes who had worked in India on making cities habitable and sustainable. So I wrote an essay in 1992 on these four. And then I started thinking about developing in a book but that happened much later. But it was, you know, it, it's not, uh, uh, I... It was kind of, then I, when I was working on it, I thought, you know, I've written about the Chipko movement, which is peasant protest from below. You can call it environmentalism from below. Right. Here I was writing envir environment above, thinkers, intellectuals, uh, reflecting on these issues, not, you know, not acting on them, not, you know, maybe protesting about them. Yeah, that's how it began. You just said that Kumarappa and uh, Mukherjee. Yeah. They anticipated the debates that were to arrive a couple of decades later. Now, just brought to my five mind. Five decades. Five decades later. later. Yeah. 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 Just brought to my mind what Ashish Nandi has said about Tagore. By yeah. the way, Tagore is also one of the characters here. That's right. So, what Ashish Nandi has written uh, about Tagore in the context of his famous novel, Gora. Gora. Yeah, yeah. Ashish Da says that in Gora, which is 1905, Tagore anticipates Savarkar. Uh. Savarkar is nowhere then. Gandhi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you are telling us that Tagore has also anticipated the Absolutely. environmentalist debate which were to emerge nearly that's right. That's, right. that's right. And Tagore also, I, I had these four people I had worked on, you know, uh, Mukherjee, Kumarappa, Elvin and Geddes. And then the for, then I started reading Tagore for other reasons. I was interested in Tagore's views on nationalism and I was interested in Tagore's views on uh, influence on Gandhi and Nehru and Bose. So I started reading for those, for other projects of mine non-environmental projects, for more political history projects. I started reading Tagore closely and I found all these dimensions of his uh, of his uh, writings which were actually very, uh, very prophetic about the environmental crisis today. Uh, so th then I finally, of course, the book starts with him. But I, I recognized Tagore's precocious environmentalism rather late in my own intellectual journey. The others I found much earlier. And most of the most of these characters, they are not environmentalist as such. They were doing things elsewhere. Other that's things, right, that's but right. you were able to locate a deep environmental concern, environmentalist concern, which was modern in that's their right. outlook. Which absolutely. was not pre-modern. Absolutely. That distinction, that distinction has to be made. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you please explain it? That how their concern was not pre-modern, yeah. like we see in ancient uh, religious texts, but was fundamentally 20th yeah. century concern. Well, 19th and 20th century. So essentially, my argument is that environmentalism as a philosophy, as a ism, uh, is born uh, in the modern world. Similarly, feminism uh, as a ism, the struggle for women's equality, is a modern phenomenon. Uh, in the case of environmentalism, feminism is possible when you have more democratic regimes where patriarchy breaks down, when the monarchy gives way to a republic and so on. Now, in the case of environmentalism, the argument is that in the pre-modern period, you could have had an environmental crisis that was local. For example, there would have been small-scale uh, deforestation. You know, a village is near a forest, it exhausts the forest, and uh, that affects its agriculture and its lifestyle. Then it moves to the next valley where it can re these those that same group of villagers can resettle and find find a new uh, right. Or uh, you know, there may be a small canal that breaches and the water logging. Is, uh, you know, affects uh, uh, you know the uh, immediate surroundings. So there were environmental uh, disorders and disturbances caused by human beings in the pre-modern past, but they impacted only the, the local ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What industrialization, urbanization, and imperialism did was to expand the scale of environmental destruction, resource capture uh, globally. So you know. Uh, and then, of course, the scale of the devastation of the forests across the Americas, the pollution in the uh, modern uh, European cities, what the colonialists did to India, uh, all this uh, brought home uh, this kind of awareness for the first time to thinkers that maybe this 
the environmental disturbances that urbanization, industrialization, new technologies like the steamship, the motor car, the use of fossil fuel, and was causing could imperil the very survival of human beings on earth, not just of a small village small in a area. water watershed or uh, one one tank that has got polluted and hmm. affects you know three hundred people. So that's why uh, this whole idea of reimagining hum hum humanity's relationship with nature, making it more uh, uh, you know, uh, making it more sensitive to the, f the various forms of environmental dimension, and also in the Indian case, bringing in elements of social justice and so on, that is only only can only happen in uh, in modern era. with urbanization, industrialization, and imperialism, and the damage it causes. So these are all modern people. So occasionally they may draw ancient motifs, like one K M Munshi was a figure in this book, or even Tagore occasionally, uh, but essentially. As a philosophy, as a moral philosophy, and also as a social movement, environmentalism is only conceivable in the modern world. That's my argument. Let's talk about this moral philosophy. There's a stream of thought which says that the concern for environment ah. was embedded in ancient Indian cus Hindu customs and rituals. Yes, yes. When you worship trees, when you worship rivers, yes. when you have a range of animals and words which are the bahana or the vehicles of deities, then there is an innate reverence yeah. uh, towards these. So the uh, you do not want to then tame the nature. Yeah. There is no desire to control the planet That's because it. the planet you conceive as 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 a divine correct, entity. Correct, correct, correct. So how do you respond to it? So this concealed uh, yeah, uh, environmentalism. So 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 it is true that in some of our ancient scriptures there is a you know a sensitivity sensitivity towards nature. Uh, it's also true that outside the ancient scriptures, which was the preserve of the elite and you know the educated classes and mostly the Brahmins, ordinary folk, peasants, tribals, pastoralists, fisher fishermen, working on a small scale in the 10th century, the 12th century, the 14th century, knew how to manage their forest, their water exactly. in a kind of sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, that, but in terms of religion, the two things. One is there are contradictory indi indications in the text. If you look at our ancient texts, you may have, uh, you know, there is a line which is often attributed, uh, uh, you know, that uh, it, uh, I mean, that having uh, planting thousand trees is equal to having a sun kind of thing, right? Uh, or, you know, reverence of, of the sun itself or of the beauty of the mountains. But how does that, but there are also in our ancient Hindu texts, uh, there is also a, occasionally a glorification or a destruction of nature. So, if you look at the episode of the burning of the Khandava forest uh, in the Mahabharata, Mahabharata. it is an exaltation of killing the tribals and the animals and the snakes. You know, it's a burning of an entire forest uh, by the victorious uh, race. Right. So, that's the first problem with going back to our ancient scriptures. The second problem is very simple. Look at the state of the Ganga. Flowing past Banaras you know, over the last 100, 150 years. You know, if we Hindus were so caring about nature, you know, there's a third problem. Look at how uh, the how the caste system transfers pollution, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, to the Dalits. Uh, how does that square with the apparent reverence for nature right. and you know, all of that? So I am very skeptical of those uh, who rely on. Ancient scriptures. There are too many contradictory elements in those traditions, and you only have to look at. I mean, look at the ravaging of the Himalaya now, mm -hmm. under a government which professes to be a Hindu government. Right. So I feel that we. It's it's it's. I would I would say, when you look at pre-modern traditions, there's more merit in looking at systems of resource management practiced by local communities who are often unlettered, illiterate rather than looking at some verses composed in the most right. beautiful Sanskrit by some great Brahmin poet. I mean, if you want to look at what, how we can use ancient wisdom uh, for modern environmental lens, you don't have to look at the Vedas, the Puranas, the Quran, the Bible, etc. Where you should go is, for example, is the work of Anupam Mishra, which you know well. I wanted to, yeah. yeah. I have and I, for that, and yeah. I cited in my book briefly. There, where he talks about water conservation in the desert, and how the peasants and the pastoralists practiced it, and what we can still uh, learn from reviving and renewing it. 
but because you named him i have a question from him a little later but let yeah. me ask right now uh, we also spoke about the local communities yeah. why does somebody like anupam mishra on whom you wrote a fantastic obituary after he passed away mm. you described him as a great environmentalist mm. why he doesn't figure in this book why he doesn't why he, he couldn't he, get a he doesn't chapter. figure in this book because this is a pre chipko book this is a book about environmentalist before chipko anupam ji's environmentalism anupam ji was a little older than me you could say that in his intellect of course he comes from a gandhian background forget all that but it was chipko that made him an environmentalist Anupam uh, went to Anupam Mishra. The chip for your younger viewers who uh, may not know the precise details of the origins of Chipko and who started Chipko. The Chipko started in the Upper Arakna Valley. The first episodes were in the Upper Arakna Valley on the old pilgrim route to Badrinath in a village called Mandal, and there from it moved to Rampur Fata and and then of course to uh, really where a remarkable Bhotia woman called Gora Devi led the protests. and the most most important influential chipko leader who mobilized and organized these protests was a remarkable gandhian called chandi prasad bhat mm-hmm. who is still alive at 90s on the jewels of india as a national treasure as you know recently wrote a beautiful autobiography which has appeared in hindi and in english and alup alupam ji was always a deeply socially conscious journalist a journalist who was Wanted to do field work with the grassroots, but it is his trips to the Chipko areas in seventy three, seventy four, and his meetings with Chandni Prasad ji that made him move basically towards environmental mm-hmm. research. Okay, and a decade after Anupam ji, I made the same uh, pilgrimage to Gopeshwar to meet Chandni Prasad ji, and then I wrote my PhD thesis. So, someone, so for example, you know, there could be, uh, there would have to be a book, uh, uh, which somebody else would have to write. On environmental thinkers from 1970 till maybe 2000, right, right. where there would be like Anubhav Mishra, there would be some remarkable journalists writing in Indian languages. There is a very fine Kannada journalist called Nagesh Hegde. Nagesh Hegde. Nagesh Hegde. Okay, journalists, pioneering English language journalists like Anil Agarwal, Kalpana Sharma, hmm. Daryl De Bonte. Then, uh, of course, scientists like Manav Gadgil, A. K. N. Reddy. So there is a comparable book like this. <laughs> Speaking, but not the origins. It's but, sequel. Uh, it's not written by someone else. Not a sequel. Someone else would have to write it. And and flag Al- bearers. Uh, yeah, flag bearers. And Alupam Ji would have must must have a central chapter. In it. He was a remarkable person. I mean, again, for you know, we are doing this interview in English. It's, we did our previous interview in Hindi. You normally do it in uh, your you know your interviews in Hindi. So there may be some uh, since this interview is in Hindi, there may be some uh, viewers who are not familiar with Hindi. Now Alupam Mishra mostly wrote in Hindi. Uh, but he gave one TED talk of eighteen minutes in English. In English. Have, have you heard it? Has he? He's got a three million, it most fabulous talk. Like I mean, that. he actually even if he somehow did not want to speak in English, but when he did, it was so eloquent and precise. And in eighteen minutes, he summarizes fifteen years work. You so everyone go to go do Google Arupam Mishra TED talk, and you know where India is in the throes of a endemic water crisis. All parts of India today. Not just Delhi, but uh, everywhere, South India, Eastern India. Just please go. Thank you for mentioning Arupam Ji. Please go and hear Arupam Mishra's TED talk, which is so inspirational, yes. so educating, so illuminating, and it and it's timeless. It's timeless because we said Arupam Mishra in Hindi, yeah. and he spoke Hindi very well. We know. Before yeah. I come to the book, let me just explain a uh, small anecdote. My one of the most delightful anecdotes with Arupam Ji. Yeah. Once I asked him yeah. in Hindi, I asked him in Hindi. कि बाढ़ क्यों आती है इट्स अ मोस्ट सिली क्वेश्चन के नास के नास बाढ़ क्यों आती है व्हाई डू फ्लड्स कम व्हाई डू फ्लड्स कम एंड वी नो द सिरोटिपिकल आंसर्स पेड़ कटते हैं ये होता है राइट तो अनुपम जी ने एक लाइन का उत्तर दिया पानी की अपनी स्मृति होती है आप उसे अपनी जगह से हटाएंगे वो लौट आएगा ही सेड वाटर हैज इट्स ओन मेमोरी इफ यू डिसलोकेट या It's from its native place. Yeah, it will return a day or two later. Yeah, yeah. What a fantastic insight! Beautiful, yeah. yeah. So he was poetic in his environmentalism, yeah. but pragmatic also. Pragmatic also, yeah. also. Coming to the book, yeah. So we know that uh, Tagore and uh, Elwin and others who who feature in this book, they spoke to the future. Huh. My question uh, is, did they also influence the future environmentalist? For instance, let me give you an instance here. 
uh, in 1950, Meera Ben writes a beautiful article in Hindustan Times, which yeah. I had in your book yeah. here, yeah. when she compares the pine tree with the oak, oak tree, tree. Yeah. and she how the pine tree yeah. uh, is unsuitable uh, for hilly terrains. It causes yeah. water uh, soil erosion, whereas the oak tree, yeah. because of the huge undergrowth, yeah. is able to retain water. water. Yeah. Do you find such gems appearing later? in the study or scholarship of Indian environmentalists? Yeah, but independent of Meera. So you re rediscover the truth afresh. You know, uh, so whether it is Meera writing about, uh, about uh, the pine oak contradiction, where it is Kumarapa writing about, uh, you know, the chochula in the, uh, in the village and how that mm. the health, the health it affects mm. the village woman. Whether you think of Geddes writing about the devastation the cities caused, now we are rediscovering them. But or, or, or other people are writing about it 50 years later with fresh eyes, without knowing that they were these pioneers. Uh, so I would say largely uh, their work was forgotten, buried, uh, and this book wants, tries to bring them back into the conversation today because as you said, their ideas are still so strikingly relevant. So we have rarely heard, for instance, Tagore being an environmentalist. No, we have heard of Tagore in many other yeah. contexts. So somebody like me who has read Tagore in so, so many other contexts. Yeah, yeah. But not as an environmentalist. Before I come to the book, I have I'll take yet another digression because we recently interviewed you over uh, the cooking of books. We know now that you wrote both the books simultaneously, uh, right? Uh, uh. After the pandemic is yeah. I want to understand from you. What is your creative process of writing? Do you have two or three or four chambers in your mind where you <laughs> so, store uh, uh, yeah. some inputs and then take yeah. them out? I don't write two books simultaneously. I write one book at a time, but I'm thinking about two or three books simultaneously. Taking notes? No, either just thinking, also taking notes in the archive. So if I, I so this book, you know, I'll tell you. So this, I'll, I'll explain. I want to understand how these two books. Are so I'll explain the thinking. process of note taking this book. So, you know, in uh, I got interested in this book in the late 80s, started gathering material. And in 1997, I was, uh, uh, you know, commissioned to write India after Gandhi. So, there was 10 years on, on contemporary Indian politics. Then there was 10 years on Mahatma Gandhi, which I wanted to do. And in the years I was doing research and through the 2000s, first two decades of the first 15 years of the uh, 20th century, I was looking at Nehru, Constitution, Ambedkar, Naxalism, economic liberalization, and then on Gandhi, on, you know, ABC things. And in the archives, I was taking notes mostly on them. But if I saw any reference to some newspaper article of uh, Radhakar Mukherjee I had not seen, or some letter written by Kumara Pa to Vinoba Bhave, I noted it. Oh. I kept a note. And I kept a separate file. You would have filed for it. Take it away. Uh, 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 mein kaam hmm. Okay. So, that is, so I'm working on one project. But I have one or two other projects which I think maybe one day I will be able to fulfill. So when I'm in the archives, I'm taking that note. Notes on 80% on my main project and 20% on these you know, subsidiary projects. But uh, when I write, uh, it's only one book. So I, a few months I, I set aside for writing that book. Uh, and uh, uh, then it's, you have to be consumed by that one book while you're writing. When you're researching your ideas and uh, you're, when you finish a draft of this book, then you're thinking about the next book, kis pe likhun, kaise likhun. but the art of writing has to be absolutely concentrated. And I don't know whether we discussed this last time, but you know, my I between 9 and 1.30, I'm at my desk. Morning. At, morning. And uh, never looking at my phone, uh, WhatsApp and FaceTime are disabled from my computer. I, I'm just thinking of what I'm writing that day. The only diversion, so I'm working on one book at a time in terms of writing. Research, maybe three or four. Uh, the only diversion would be once in a fortnight I have to write a column, which is unconnected with this book. So that one day I have to set aside. For During those four, year, four hours. Or for hours, at the afternoon, little revising and so on. So, yeah, but uh, but yeah, I think, I, have, I mean, the thing is, it, it was nice to have several interests because then you could, like, you know, like again, for example, I always knew I would write a book on Gandhi. I was actually always means always means from the time so no, at least because see my first two projects were Chipko, which is deeply influenced by Gandhian traditions Gandhi. of protest. Elvin who had a very complicated father son relationship with Gandhi. So I always knew I didn't know what form it would take. So after again we are talking digressing from the book more and my oh, writing good, yeah, journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I wrote a book on Elvin, uh, on Chipko on 
Himalayan forests and peasants. Then I wrote a book on Elvin. Then I started working on the social history of cricket, which is uh, which is you know which features the Dalit cricketer called Palwan Kripalu, and the main one of the main sources for that book was an extraordinary newspaper called Bombay Chronicle, which is, in my view, the greatest English language newspaper India has ever produced. English language, because I don't know all the other fabulous paper in and in India's greatest city, writing in, in about Bombay from 1913 to 1956 when it collapsed, and from a really from a Indian point of view, covering the film industry, working class struggles, and of course cricket, the politics of cricket. So while I was looking at the politics of cricket, I would see references to Gandhi. Gandhi has come to the city. He has met some or so some editorial saying, "Why is he not meeting so and so? Maybe Sardar Patel is out of favor. Maybe something." And then I would just take notes because I thought, "Kabi ye kaba 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 aega." So that is so. In that sense, I do have three or four different balls and juggling, step juggling. But when I'm writing, I'm not thinking about my next book or my next column. I'm just thinking of that task at hand. So you started writing it only after the cooking of books was yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, previous yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the curious characters in this book is K. M. Munshi, mm -hmm. who we describe as the first Hindutva environmentalist. Uh -huh. I want to understand this term from you. Okay. Also, okay. let me explain a bit of my readerly. Uh, It's not reservation. Uh, my it. understanding. It seems you included him uh, largely to show us that how shallow Saffron environmentalism <laughs> can be. Uh. Is it? No, no. I included him because he is a powerful writer, and uh, 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 but uh, yeah, I mean, I I came to the conclusion that Saffron environmentalism is Saffron is shallow, but it's interesting. Just as uh, you know. Uh, the Gandhian environmentalists of the 70s and the 80s did not know about Kumarappa at all and barely knew about Mirabel. The Saffron environmentalists today don't know about Kiyam Muchiki. So how, how history their precursors are, are forgotten. I mean, he was a fascinating character. Again, he's a little bit like Tagore because he's known for other things. He's a celebrated writer right, in Gujarati, right. uh, you know, minister, minister, lawyer, helped helped uh, you know in, in the Constituent Assembly. Was the last Indian representative to Hyderabad when. Hyderabad became part of India. Very just founded the Bharatiya Vidya Bharwal, coined the phrase Vishwa Guru. You know, so but this part of him that in two years when he was minister, accidentally made minister of agriculture with responsibility of forest. He did what many people do now, which is try and link contemporary environmental concerns with in, say the the wisdom in our ancient scriptures is all there to solve uh, our current problems. And of course, it's very interesting that as I say on show in my speeches. He used such a caste system, isn't he? I mean, when he, Bunshi st started Vana Mahotsava, an annual tea tree planting festival, which is basically uh, has been a largely a complete failure. You know, plantings have saplings have been planted; they have not survived. They are mostly of exotic species, unsuited to us. Anyway, he started this tamasha, and when he started it, his first speech was in Bombay because he has made his name as a lawyer and novelist in Bombay, and he may have been the most prominent Gujarati in Bombay, he addressing a group of Gujarati merchants, saying, "You have to support my new festival, and I am a Brahmin. You are Badiyas. You have to support me. <laughs> Give me arms." Now, now this is very interesting. Uh, so, but you know, I mean, the language is so very evocative. I mean, the thing is, even when you disagree with Munshi's ideas. He expresses his ideas so well, so with such passion, with such elegance, eloquence, that I had to quote him at length. And I mean, it's another aspect. He was a multifaceted, complex man, and uh, really deserves a good biography written by someone who is uh, absolutely fluent in Gujarati and in English. You know, he he was a very interesting man. I mean, he was like much more interesting than uh, Golwalkar and probably even Savarkar. And he was doing all these one mouth stuff. He was organizing as a cabinet minister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the thread that you find among all the nine characters that you have drawn in the book? So, other the, than a shared concern for environment. So, I think they are. I think they are thinkers, writers, reflecting on these issues. Uh, they are also diverse. They work, but they all. But at the same time, they are diverse in the. Uh, in, they work in many different fields. You know, uh, some work on the wilderness, some work on the forest, some work on the right of a farm, some right of the city. They have different professions. They are writers like Elwin uh, and uh, Tagore. They are activists like Meera Ben, Gandhian activists like Meera Ben and Kumarappa. Uh, they are professors like uh, Mukherjee and Gaddis. You know, there's a, polit a politician like Munshi. 
so they are diverse uh, and the scientists like uh, also howard and uh, uh, gabriel gabriel and albert howard so and they, they work in different parts of india so i think if they show the diversity of our environmental challenges today also you know so i don't think there's no common thread that binds them except that seven out of them uh, wanted to marry environment um, not merge and blend environmental sustainability with social justice you know they were not simply interested in protecting nature for aesthetic reasons for reasons of beauty or making sure that endangered species like the tiger and the elephant don't go out so they were not in that sense they were this is why i always like to emphasize the title of this book it is speaking with nature it is not speaking for nature a tiger lover is speaking for nature right he or she is in the in delhi leading a rather comfortable resource intensive life and then goes to the forest and sees the tiger and someone tells him that these uh, villagers are coming and grazing and spoiling the tiger's habitat and then that is a great outrage in a social media campaign and i am speaking for nature not just for human beings these people are want to build a relations human beings are part of nature so what is the relationship that can be with nature and i think that is what uh, except for munshi who is an out and out uh, you know religious uh, chauvinist and uh, krishna who is only interested in the wild not in human beings the others are trying to integrate human society with the natural world and do it and also alert to inequalities within human society of class of region of caste and of gen- less so of gender gender they are not that at that stage not so much aware of but when we talk about uh, speaking with nature and emphasize social justice huh. must be a major part or the component of environmentalism today in a yeah. country like india in a country like india in a country elsewhere like. also I in a country like brazil in a country like south africa yeah. and even in america you know i think something about america uh, which is a very interesting not not known to many people and i i said a little bit about the history of environmentalism in america so american environmentalism began speaking for, as speaking for nature so they had these uh, they had these pioneering thinkers john muir who helped save the california redwoods henry david thoreau who, who extolled the walden, walden, yeah. went to walden so it was speaking for nature and the when the movement modern movement started in 60s and 70s earth day will protect the earth will protect uh, the national park system will protect the coast that, that was what uh, it was right then and it was all white largely male and all white and then uh, it turned out that Uh, while this movement was taking place uh, the whole process of american industrialization had led had, uh, had led to forms in the cities had led to form the environmental abuse which the black, black population was subjecting to so their shanties were where the water source was more polluted uh, you know the the incinerators which burned garbage were near where they were the polluting uh, chemical factories were sited near the black uh, black and hispanic uh, households so there was a movement that called itself uh, you know uh, against environmental racism uh, the environment kind of an environmental justice movement right which is kind of parallel to chip cohen that is blending uh, safe clean environment with a concern for the dignity of those underprivileged people so, and but the american environmental movement is still very much white elite and in this country that's being reproduced you know nowadays the enchantment of the urban affluent urban class with our wildlife sanctuaries and only with the animals you know it's quite extraordinary they don't think of even of the population living around you know it's like uh, you know the human beings who have been surviving in that forest and coexisting with the tiger and the elephant and it's kind of a it's a kind of very elite centered en- environmentalism which is only about arrogating to your, yourself the right to speak for nature while disregarding the interests of other human beings where do you place our native systems you uh, come from dehradun yeah. i have lived for several years in shimla another himal yeah. another hilly town i have lots of experience of abujmar we have seen native communities yeah yeah they are able to negotiate with the environment with the natural resources in a way that doesn't degrade it that's right yeah of course i i think that's uh, i mean that is something which i have written about in my earlier work and, but that is rapidly eroding because many of these local communities also want to aspire to a modern lifestyle they want to have a big house a car and that it's a very it's it's kind of a, a trap uh, and it's, it's a very seductive trap uh, but uh, yeah it's but i think uh, i think we uh, this book is a history of ideas 
it's a profile of 10 remarkable individuals who wrote an insight and uh, about the challenges that humanity faces and India in particular faces. But what lessons it can have for the present uh, is not for me to uh, uh, say. I don't, I mean, I don't believe the job of a historian is to orient their reader in a particular way. Like this is the solution. Yeah, yeah, this is the solution. You don't prescribe the solution. I how, don't prescribe. How can we tackle the challenge? That I don't, as a historian, must not get into prescription or prediction. Or you can gently, very gently uh, nudge the reader towards seeing uh, how, uh, what this work of historical scholarship narrates, what relevance it has to the present. That I do in the epilogue. But in, I don't, in the ninth chapter of the book, I don't say, Tum tagor se ye lo, tum mira ben se ye seko. No, none of that. None of that. They may still learn things. But in the epilogue, I very gently uh, alert the reader to the contemporary relevance of these writers. Someone writing in the 1930s still speaks to us today. So listen, what you make of their thought, their writing, their argument, their concerns is up to you as a citizen today. But don't dismiss them as fossils, antiquarian, antiquarian anti-development, anti-growth. They are actually issuing some warnings that we should all really be quite aware of. I have one last question. How do you find uh, the environmental movement at present becoming hostage of the term climate change? It seems that yes, is yes, yes. that has that is the concern only. That is which makes an easy headline. Yes, yes. Uh, which That's, makes for easy project proposals. It is deeply, deeply, deeply unfortunate. Uh, of course, climate change is real. It's visible. It's affecting us all, and we'll, it will probably get worse. The effects, the unpredictable weather effects. You know, we will be find it even more difficult to deal with floods, cyclones, uh, droughts, uh, uh, and so on. But I, w w I like to say that even if climate change did not exist, India would be an environmental disaster zone. We are speaking in Delhi today around Diwali and the air quality index must be 400, in excess of 400. This is, and this is true all across northern India. So not not, not just the power. Uh, yeah. yeah, and not, not, a, not just a Delhi problem. And this is independent of climate change. Alupa Mishra often talked about the death of the Jamana, on which, the, which is happening independent of climate change. The Ganga outside Banaras has been killed uh, by faulty policies and it could have happened independent of climate change. The chemical contamination of the soil, uh, the uh, depletion of groundwater aquifers, uh, uh, in, even in uh, especially in states like Punjab. Now, all this is exacting a horrif horrific cost on human health and human livelihood. These are multiple forms of environmental degradation that adversely impact 400, 500 million Indians on a daily basis. And these are all occurring independent of climate change. Climate change makes it worse. So, uh, particularly in mountain areas like the Himalaya, like in Himachal has had floods, the Uttarakhand has had floods. You've already made the mountainside fragile by uh, bad road construction, by foolishly constructed dams, you know, carelessly planned dams. Uh, you made them vulnerable by over, uh, by encouraging excessive tourism and building of, you know, hotels and lodges on uh, fragile slopes. So it's already a problem. And then a a uh, flash flood comes in May and instead of in, in July and it's all washed away. So climate change intensifies problems that have already been caused by greed, by corruption, uh, by, you know, uh, by the con consumer society, by the politicians' net uh, uh, ignorance of the scientific advice that they've got and so on. But the overall, making climate change the kind of touchstone of environmentalism is hugely problematic. Because it's much more than that. It goes beyond climate change. But as you say, it's sexy. I mean, if you want to write a grand proposal as a scientist and you or as a journalist, climate change, uh, yeah. wo paisa mil you know? so, but I think that's unfortunate. It is an easy tendency, think, to, uh, yeah. Yeah, easy tendency to attribute every environmental crisis to climate change. So I must say, I almost fell uh, tempt uh, prey to the temptation, uh, though this book is not about climate change. I almost called it environmentalism before climate change to have a what's it called clickbait headline, right? Then I said no. Was it your idea or the publishers? No, no. It, the original title was mine, and then a friend advised me. 
uh, a very good historian friend, very great scholar in America, who read the manuscript said, don't use that phrase. This is not either before, beyond. This is about something else. It doesn't do justice uh, to the... So the book's integrity rests on the research you've done. True. Don't use the clickbait title. Right. So, and I'm very grateful I took his advice. Thank you so much, Ram. Uh, we hope we meet again yes. with the new book very soon. And I hope that this book will take the reader to the ancestors of Indian environmentalism as it emerged in the second half of the uh, last century, 20th century. But more importantly, as we discussed, it also whets the appetite of the reader to then look for their own own heroes in the last 30 40 years like anupam mishra like medha patkar chandi prashad bhat and many many others thank you so much Ram.